Good morning, everyone. My name's Guy Davidson. I'm the coding manager at Creative Assembly. We're owned by Sega, and we make such games as the Total War franchise, uh, the recently released Halo Wars 2, uh, Alien Isolation, all sorts of lovely things like that. We've been around for about 30 years. We'll be celebrating our 30th anniversary in a few weeks. And we're one of the oldest game companies still running in the UK. <coughs> Today, I want to talk about writing games in very modern C++. Um, I'll explain what I mean by very modern C++ as time goes on. Um, who plays games here? Wow. Lots of you. Excellent. I speak in schools quite a lot. And I ask the question, who plays games here? Arm shoot up, everybody plays games. But as recently as 10 years ago, there'd be sort of two or three chaps at the front or the side who'd... who'd... 10 years ago, something happened. Anyone guess what happened 10 years ago? Nope. Nope. The iPhone. The iPhone. <laughs> right, hang on. I have a piece of video. Oh, but no audio. Should we be getting audio from the HDMI? That's going to, that's, ooh, all right then. <laughs> this is Steve Jobs saying, Steve Jobs? Steve Jobs. <laughs> He's been gunned so long, I forget it all now. Um, saying, swipe to unlock. He said, swipe to unlock. Everybody went absolutely wild. It was a proper OMG moment. Doing it again there, just to make sure. Did you get it? Swipe to unlock. You're at the home page of the iPhone. Marvelous. Um, so yes, OMG. Really, OMG. Everyone went mild, wild, swipe to unlock. Suddenly, um, phones became game devices. So everyone has phones. Everyone got phones to play games on. I mean, they made phone calls as well and sent texts, but an enormous number of people were playing games on phones, and suddenly everybody in the school room was playing games, much to the annoyance of, of, of teachers everywhere, I'm told. But we got a new audience. Um, but of course, with all these games, discoverability became a real problem. Here are some fun facts. Um, how many apps are available for download today on the App Store? Uh, well, Wikipedia didn't tell me which one. <laughs> it just said the app. A billion? Wow. Well, it says three million here for the, for the iPhone app store. Wow. A million. A billion is a lot. That's, that's one for every six people, seven people on the planet. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to contest that lightly, if I may. Um, Here's an interesting one. The, num the number of active publishers in the US App Store, the American App Store, 661,000, which is the proportion of the population of America is, is you know, quite significant. OK, how many games on the App Store? 771,000. How many games were released per day this month, this April? 129 every day the average price of which was 48 cents. <laughs> Making games is a huge lottery. Frankly, it's just a giant lottery ticket. Right, today I'm going to be talking about history of video games, just briefly, how to write a game, um, SG-13 and very modern C++. Let's make asteroids, that's the scary bit. But, you know, it's rock and roll. Asteroids rock. <laughs> <laughs> and some bigger picture issues. So let's start with the history of video games. So first of all, can anyone suggest what the first computer game was, might have been? Oh, that's even later than I was expecting you to say. Earlier than Pong. Earlier than Space War. Oh, very good. No, earlier than that. <laughs> OK, well, I'm probably cheating a bit here because I know the answer. And I was quite surprised. Turo Champ, written by Alan Turing. <laughs> I know. This was, in fact, a chess program that he devised um, with David Champanan in 1948. It was never implemented, so maybe it wasn't the first computer. <laughs> 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 More realistically, Bertie the Brain. Um, this was a noughts and crosses game by Joseph Cates at Rogers Majestic, and it was part of the Canadian uh, National Exhibition, 1950. Okay? And also Nimrod, which played the game of Nim, 
Uh, this was by John Bennett, built by Raymond Stuart Williams at Ferranti. This displayed at the Festival of Britain in 1951. But they weren't actually video games. They displayed their output onto a matrix of lights rather than actually on a screen. If anybody has any photographs of these working, I, I scoured for, anything, for, for any evidence of this, but it could actually just all be a giant bluff, as far as I'm aware. <laughs> Pictures are it didn't happen, frankly. Um, 1952, Checkers. Now, this was actually the first game to use a screen, to use a, a, a display, rather than a simple, you know, rather, rather than just a matrix of lights. Um, this was on the Ferranti Mark I. It was built by Christopher Strachey. Oxo on the EDSAC. Same year, 1952, by Alexander Douglas. But these were static graphics. These were simply displaying a state. <coughs> Animated graphics, 1954, Game of Pool on the Midsac uh, by William Brown and Ted Lewis. But these were all just demonstrations of majestic, awesome computing power of the, uh, of the 20th century. 1958, we get the first game purely for um, amusements. And this was at Brookhaven National Laboratory for their open days, called Tennis for Two, possibly the one that you were referring to. Um, and I could, again, I couldn't get a photo of, of that, but I got a photo of this controller, which apparently is exactly like the controller that was used. Rotating paddle and a serve button. Deployed on an analog computer with an oscilloscope uh, for display. Right, into the 60s. Space war. This was the first one that everyone thinks about. Um, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, they received a PDP-1. Um, with a point plotting monitor. And what was significant about this was that there were PDP-1s sort of all around America. And so people took, looked at Space War, thought, wow, this is great. It looked like this. <laughs> that was great. Um, custom built a control box to move it around. Um, and it was, uh, people, people were so taken by this that they moved it, they, they, they took copies of the code, of the software, moved it all around the country, and suddenly Space War was everywhere. And this was significant because as computers became less exotic uh, during the time, then programmers were introduced to programming by you know, writing simple logic puzzles, card games, little challenges like that. They you know, swap them with each other and, and, and challenge each other. Still very much, well, certainly the way I learned to program. Um, of course, it wasn't cheap. PDP ones were you know, significantly expensive, but transistor, transistor logic, uh, that turned up in about 1970, reduced cost still further. And Nolan Bushnell, anyone heard of him? Yes. Yep, started Atari, absolutely, great fellow. Um, and Sega already had electromechanical games in their arcades, but Nolan Bushnell thought, you know what, I can turn Space 4 into a coin-operated machine called Computer Space. Who played that? No, it wasn't very successful, and you're probably all too, too young. Anyway. <laughs> um, but also, on televisions, um, the Magnavox Odyssey turned up as a game that would, as a device that would plug into a television and play Pong. Looked like that. Uh, had a little English international switch on the left hand side, so I guess it was designed for the international market, but uh, again, not especially successful. But if you're British, or American actually, and you remember a time before computer games, the first game that you probably played was Pong. Um, Nolan Bushnell again from Atari. 1975, Gunfight. Anyone remember Gunfight? We're kind of getting into it. Oh, yes, I remember Gunfight. Do you know what's significant about it? It was the first game written in software. Not in, it's the first coin-operated game written in software, not using transistor-transistor logic. Um, this is where things kicked off. Uh, Breakout in 1976 by Atari. That was a particular favorite of mine. That was extraordinarily successful. Space Invaders was where it properly hit consciousness in 1979. Arcades flourished in the 70s and, uh, and in the 80s, but the home market wasn't a slouch either. We had the uh, Magnavox 100, Odyssey 100 in 1975. That was a Pong game, as was Home Pong by Atari and Telstar by Coleco in 75 and 76. Uh, and the UK and Europe was hit by the craze too. We got all our stuff from Hong Kong suppliers. Uh, we didn't actually make, any, make any, many of our own. But um, everybody got rather bored with paddle and ball games. And then, Fairchild Semiconductor came out with something called Channel F um, in 1977. Um, it was programmable and it had games on cartridges that you could plug in and out of the device. So it's starting to sound familiar now. And of course, we had the Atari VCS in 77, the Magnavox Odyssey Squared, and the Mattel in television. This is all in the late 70s. But come the 80s, 
come the home computer boom. Who had a home computer in the 80s? My people, thank you. <laughs> At last. So we had, right, let's have a cheer. Who had one of these? Yes. The greatest of computers. <laughs> no, don't laugh. It's too. We had Commodore. Yeah, yeah, 6502 processor and the 68000 processor. Z80 on the ZX80 E to 1 of Spectrum. Sorry? Oh, okay. Um, and of course, the Acorn, Atom, Electron, BBC Micro, the school computer. Um, anyone program on an Atom? Not hugely popular. My first programming experience was on an Acorn Atom. And of course, I should mention Atari. They didn't really sell particularly well in the UK until it got to about the ST. Um, and then, of course, I need to mention the Nintendo Famicom and the Sega consoles. These weren't computers, these were game systems, really. Right, into the 90s. Now we're getting into recent memory for most of you, I hope. We have the 16-bit consoles, the Mega Drive, Nintendo SNES. Um, and by the mid-90s, 3D hardware starts appearing. We started getting uh, you know, really dedicated processors just for doing 3D graphics. Turned up in video games, particularly Virtua Fighter and Virtua Racing. Then we got the 32-bit consoles that started to use 3D hardware, Saturn and the PlayStation. And then, of course, 3DFX came out with the uh, Voodoo Graphics chipset on an ISA card to slip into PCs. And we got the DirectX um, API from Microsoft. This is uh, 1996. And then the 90s closed with the consoles, Nintendo 64, Sega Dreamcast, Sony PlayStation 2. And really, this century has there's not been much change from a, from a hardware experience. It still looks pretty much like it did in this period. We've got um, ever more powerful consoles and graphics cards. And in addition, we've got mobile phones, mobile games. Um, they're, they've proliferated, as, as I said. Suddenly, that's the majority gameplay device. They're little pocket computers with enormous, you know, power of a Cray on them. Did anybody spot the deliberate mistake in the Cray lyrics round? No? You two are an Irish band. They're not a British band. They're from Dublin. <laughs> <sighs> My wife's Irish, so... <laughs> Um, online gaming is probably the biggest innovation of this century, although actually it's not this century. It's Richard Bartle here. He often turns up at these things. He gave us the multi-user dungeon um, when he was at Essex University in 1979, which was the first kind of you know, online text-based uh, dungeon explorer. So my provocation is that C++ is in part stuck in the 1970s. Um, Ponder that as we move on to the next section, how to write a game. So the fundamental quality of games is that you are interacting with a constrained rule system. Okay? So before you start writing any code, you need to model the rules of that simulation. You're going to simulate those rules, you can model them, you're going to interact with them. Right, Pong, that's a really, really, really simple game. So I want you to imagine we're recreating it in software. What do you think the rules are? Oh, anybody got? Sorry? Avoid missing ball for high score. Okay, what about the actual, the, the objects that you're controlling within the, within the model? Okay, can't move the paddle off the screen. Okay, that's one. Yep, it travels in a straight line. Okay, yep. Bats are controlled by the players. They can only travel vertically. Um, constant velocity. That'd be quite fun, though. Actually, if you could hit it at the edges and suddenly it would, it would give it a speed up and move there. Okay, not this one. Also, there, were, there was, I, I researched this, there were some, some, some later versions of Pong where the bat was divided into three. And if you've got the ball on the, on the edges of the bat, you've widened the angle. Um, but initially, Pong didn't quite work like that. Well, I came up with ball travels in a straight line at constant velocity. Ball bounces off the top and bottom of the play area. Ball bounces off the bats at left and right of play area. Bats are controlled by players. Bats move along the y-axis. Because that would be fun if they moved in as well. It would be more like a 
real tennis game. And if the ball reaches the side and is not hit by a bat, the ball leaves play and a point is scored. Finite, and a new ball is served with a finite number of times. Okay, so how do we model a simulation? Um, well, you create a data structure containing the state of the simulation, all the bits and pieces, and you tick it over time regularly, applying all those rules. Um, so what should the state consist of? Score. Score. Brilliant. Yep. Positions of the bat. Positions of the bat. Positions of the ball. Positions of the ball. This is almost in the order I have it. <laughs> Velocity of the ball. Boundary positions. Right. Displaying the simulation. So this is a little easier to work out. What are we going to draw? It's not a trick question. <laughs> Boundaries, bats, ball, score, net, which is not part of the state. But it's just there, it's a little bit extra. Right, controlling the simulation. So this is significant. If we aren't controlling any aspect of the simulation, you've you basically you've just got to a toy, something that you're watching, that you're not interacting with. Um, anyone, anyone here implement Conway's Life when they were learning to program the cellular automaton? Yeah, yeah, it's a great, great trick to start with. Um, and I remember the first time I implemented it, it was, um, I'd set it going, and I'd watch it, and, and this isn't a game, it was in a book of games. Conway's Life is not a game. There needs to be some kind of interactive control. <coughs> so what are we going to control? Okay. One other thing. Serve. Serve. Good. Right. So there we are. And just to hammer the points, we have a model, a view, and a controller. And that's it. Um, of course, you can introduce more complicated rules. You can get, you know, you can go absolutely bonkers with this. Um, great wizzy display, more controllers, and, and you know, games evolve like this. Um, anyone ever play Defender in the 80s as an arcade? Yeah, okay, who remembers the controls? Okay. Yep, up and down in reverse. Got a hyperspace button. Smart bomb, two more. Uh, all right, four more. <laughs> Another two. Fire, yes, fire. One more. There was thrust. Seven controls. I felt like a god playing Defender. It was, it was like playing the piano, frankly. Um, you can, of course, get quite extreme. Um, did anyone actually play Total War? Oh. <laughs> Don't be shy. <laughs> it's really good. It's really good. Thank you, Andy. Yes, it is. It's really good. Um, <laughs> no, it is. Actually, it is really good. Um, you're simulating... Desktop, uh, desktop, actually maybe desktop, tabletop warfare. There's units, it's, it's battles. There's an enormous amount of control going on. And not only that, we've also got a, a campaign map based over a, you know, a large area where you're, you're running a, a you know, many century uh, uh, cam campaign of dominance of the world. Um, Warhammer is our latest iteration. We've just announced Warhammer 2, but normally we're running um, historical battles. We've done the Roman era, era the Shogun era, the kind of Renaissance era. It's a... Uh, Big franchise. Right. Does anyone have any water? Um, yes, thank you very much. Right, well, so without volume, this is going to be almost pointless, but this is a run through of the examples of um, the Total War games. The idea is I want to try and give you an, an example of the. Uh, or, uh, I. Volume's up at maximum on here. It doesn't seem to be coming through the HDMI port. Um, so here's our, here's our battlefield. You can, oh, wow. It does go quite quickly, doesn't it? Uh, <laughs> the idea is you've got campaigns, you've got battlefields. Um, you're controlling large numbers of units, giving them all sorts of different orders about whether they're running or walking whether they're striking. Uh, 
And as we go through time, you see it becomes the, the display, the graphics become more and more sophisticated. Nearly all of this stuff is done with the uh, in-engine game. The in-game engine, sorry. <coughs> Death, mayhem, destruction. <laughs> Everyone's favorite things. We even did versions on the tablets and on mobiles. Thank you very much, Andy. You get the theme, though. Death, destruction, mayhem, fire, <laughs> trebuchets, anger. <coughs> very therapeutic, very cathartic. We have, an, we have an online battle arena. It's a multiplayer thing. That's going pretty well. More from the tablets. I learned so much about fourth century Europe making this game. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God. Um, so since games became coin operated, they've needed to attract attention. They need to be bright, whizzy, shiny. So color and pixel resolution in the hardware has always been the, 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 thing, to, the thing to go for, the thing to show mastery of. Um, and also frame rates. Um, there's nothing more dull than a game that runs at about six frames a second. It's very, it's, you're disjointed, you're separated from it. Um, if ever there was a gladiatorial arena for programming, games is the one. This is where there's an enormous amount of showing off and competition, frankly. Um, that's my game dev history in languages. I start off in Z80 on the Spectrum, but also the 6502 on the uh, Acorn Atom, Atari ST, 68000. And whilst I had an Atari ST, I bought a hard drive which had Lattice C on it. Started programming in C, and then in 1986, I was invited by um, my university to take a look at C++. Um, they said, oh, this is news, this is interesting, what's all this about? Um, little, little did I know, that <laughs> 30 years later, um, memory mapped graphics are how things originally worked though. It was quite easy. You had a graphics card, and you, well you didn't have a graphics card, you had hardware inside your machine, and you knew where all the pixels were. You knew what their address was, and you say, all right, I'd like to hit this pixel please. And so you say, oh well that's at address um, 0x40000 on the um, spectrum, I think. Yeah, exactly. And you say, right, I'll have, that, I'll have that pixel, I'll give it this value, which will make it this color. And it was actually quite simple. Um, the hardware would you know, just define a memory just for each pixel. Good to go. That's fine. Um, unfortunately, it's not like that anymore. We have a, um, a barrage of platform independent graphics libraries because the trouble with memory mapped graphics, it's only going to work on the one machine. And when what we had was a spectrum and said, right, I'm writing for all the spectrums, it's easy. Once you're writing for lots and lots of machines, uh, you need platform independent graphics libraries. Um, so porting is the thing, you see. To maximize your market, you need to write for more than one platform, otherwise you've got this big fragmentation problem. Um, typically, different machines would have different resolutions. You'd have to change your straight line drawing algorithms, for example. Um, you'd have different color depths, so that would this would be problematic because you'd think, well, all this stuff I've got works as assuming that we've got, you know, two pixels per, uh, two colors per pixel or two <coughs> colors per, per chunk, but you might have, you know, really well-featured graphics and so you don't want to, you know, fall foul of all the other games that are targeting that machine. You need to reauthor all your stuff. You might have hardware scrolling. If you're on the Commodore 64, you've got hardware scrolling. That was brilliant. Unfortunately, nobody else had it. So if you wrote something for the Commodore 64, that's where it stayed. What we really needed was a standard platform and a standard language. So did someone say C on the PC? Let's look at some graphics libraries. They started appearing. OpenGL. Right, this recently celebrated its 25th birthday. Um, cross-language, cross-platform API for rendering 2D and 3D graphics. It's the most wisely used um, graphics library at the moment. 
Um, it interacts with the GPU to achieve all its, uh, to, to, it, it writes to the GPU to do, to do all its work. Um, and GPU vendors supply OpenGL drivers. So OpenGL works like this. Vendors say, oh, I'll write my bit to cooperate with your bit. Works fine. Um, DirectX, it's, no, it's, no, it's quite old as well. Uh, this came out in 1995, and I think it was actually bought from another company. I forget the name. Sorry? No? Oh, forgive me. I'll believe you're... Uh... <laughs> really? <coughs> Excellent, thank you. An experiment that, ne that nearly failed but got the eye of Bill Gates. I must talk to you later. This will interest my history. Uh... History interests. Vulcan, this is new. Um, this is the kind of next generation OpenGL. It's the new kid on the block, released about a year ago. Um, it's, it's the next generation OpenGL, available on a wide variety of operating systems. Um, look into it, really great. Um, Cairo, I'm mentioning Cairo because uh, this is going to come up shortly. Uh, it's different from the previous selection. It's not necessarily going to exploit um, you know, graphics hardware, unless it's there, unless the graphics you know, vendors decide that they're going to supply Cairo drivers or things like that. Um, but it provides a vector graphics API and primitives, and, and the API is a C API. Um, we've also, I also wanted to include Skia because that does the same thing, but it's using a C++ API, and it's stateless as well. Um, Sorry? Okay. All right. I'll buy that. But I know what you're thinking. <laughs> right, SG13, I'm very modern C++. Um, didn't we see my talk last year? Oh, thank you for coming back. That's good. <laughs> you'll, see, you'll see me um, show this diagram. This is your C++ org chart, basically, the, uh, for, for, the, for the committee. Um, study groups at the bottom. Last, last year, I was talking about SG14, game dev and low latency. Um, since then, I've had a look around SG13, which is the um, HMI, which stands for Human Machine Interface. Um, it's currently listed as dormant, actually. Um, but there haven't been many posts recently, but don't let that put you off. The first post was on August the 24th, 2013, which was a Saturday, which I admire. Um, I'm not going to trawl through the reflector for you. It'll take you about you know, two or three hours if you're interested. It's actually worth a read, interesting discussion. Um, but the purpose of the group was to get a 2D API into the standard. Um, Mike McLaughlin grabbed the bull by the horns. He offered a proposal about three weeks after this date. Um, it drew from several libraries. Um, there was some sort of toing and throwing and more discussion. And we ended up with um, basing the library around Cairo, which, as I said, is a C library, not a C++ library. Um, but it's more feasible to upgrade a C, li C library to a you know, C++ wrapped facade. The first proposal, January 2014. Um, and the first wording followed two years later. Um, and the reason for the long wait is that the wording ran to 192 pages. Um, a few weeks ago, it was all too late for um, uh, this presentation, the latest revision was shipped. Um, here are the classes in that revision. We've got you know, your color class. We've got some geometry classes. Um, we have some paths. And we actually have quite a lot of paths. Uh, we have a brush class. And we have some surface classes. Um, so, right, best way to show you is to actually use it. Here's the scary bit. Um, I'm going to have to swap my to my Windows laptop now, so um, stand back. I'm about to do IT. <laughs> Any questions, meanwhile? Mm -hmm. It's a great question. Um, very rich answer. I recommend you look at the reflector. Um, the summary that I could... There's no summary post on the reflector. Somebody could probably do a good job of suggesting why it landed there. As far as I can see, it looks like the, 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 the second suggestion was skier because it was already C++. But I think the idea is that Cairo has been, it's old, it's battle-hardened, it works, it does, the, it does the trick. Now, why is this machine not playing ball? 
Sorry? On the media library, yes. That's, that's another option. Uh, right, let's go. So, okay, can we all read that at the back? Can you read it? Do you care if you can't? <laughs> all right, then. So, the way I'm going to run this. Here is all the uh, here's all the code which you can't read. Not actually that much, but let's start with the um, the solution project I made earlier. Um, you'll see there's two projects. One is the reference implementation of N three triple eight, just there, and the other is a static library, ACCU, in which we'll put the asteroids game. If we look at the entry points here. What's going on is we set a draw callback after making a display surface this color, um, color style, that resolution. <coughs> and then we paint using a color, and then we render some text in a particular position using a color, aqua, and then we return show. Um, so let's take a look and see what that looks like. There we are. That's fire brick red. That's aqua. That's blue text saying hello world. There we are. So I've created some source files in the Asteroids project, which we're going to fill up. So let's start with the game class. I'm going to put a constructor in there. There we are. And an update function, which takes the display surface. Let's implement this. There we are. We're just going to draw the screen black, because this is asteroids. It's set in space. In space, it's black. I'm told, there's white points of color and things like that, but largely the, the dominant color is black. And then let's wire this into the entry point. Just replace that entirely. So we're going to make our game, and then there's our display surface, and we're just gonna call our update function, bang. Vittorio. Why Okay. <laughs> there we are. Black screen. Thank you. <laughs> wow, at last, some atmosphere. Let's, <laughs> let's build on this, shall we? <laughs> Do you know what? The next line in my notes was actually woo. <laughs> okay. Now a bit of modeling. So I've created a maths and a physics header. Um, and we can argue about what goes where later. This is one of those popular arguments in games companies saying, oh, no, this is maths. No, no, this is physics. No, it's maths. I'm going to tell you what's in maths. <laughs> I'm a maths graduate. <clears throat> now, I'm going, to, I'm going to be working in a game that features rotation. So. The uh, stud experimental IO2D is where, the, where everything lives that we're uh, importing from the reference implementation. So I have X2D, just going to call it that. Since we're going to be using rotation, I want polar coordinates as well. Are we familiar with polar coordinates? Anyone not familiar with polar coordinates? That's going to get complicated otherwise. No, good, all right, splendid. Um, so we have R and theta, and we have accessor functions, and a simple constructor. Now, I'm going to be able to need to convert between Cartesian 
and polar coordinates. So let's have some helper functions. Just stick them in here. So it returns a vector 2D, polar to Cartesian, returns a polar 2D, Cartesian to polar. Again, no rocket science. R cos theta, R sine theta for x and y, and to go the other way, we get the magnitude of the vector, and then we take a tan two of y upon x. This is all, you know, elementary mathematics. Physics H. So I've declared position, velocity, and acceleration. Quite not unreasonably, I think. So we have a simple physics class, which takes position and velocity. And we have an update function. So let's look at the update function in source. There we are. That's easy, isn't it? Take the position, add the velocity. Right, let's do some actual drawing. Now to do that, I'm going to define something called a path buffer. Let's just put it here. So, I'm kind of cheating here. I've got an array of 14 vectors. All the objects I draw are going to be less than 14 points big. So I'm thinking just to save any kind of dynamic monkeying around or things like that, we'll just have 14 points to make everything. So we have a path buffer which says how many of those points we're going to use and the vertices. Now, we'll also declare a function to, declare, to create a scaled path buffer. Now, the reason why I want to do that um, is everyone familiar with the game of asteroids? Okay. Um, there's four kinds of asteroids, and they come in three sizes, but they're the same asteroid, just made bigger and smaller. So it makes it sense to store the prototype asteroid and then create a path from it, and then we'll just provide the size that's there that we're going to scale by. So let's implement that in physics CPP. So far, I haven't used a for loop. I don't think I'm going to. So given our path buffer and our size, we create the thing that we're going to return, and then we iterate through it all entirely, and multiply by the size and then return our path buffer. Okay, we're getting somewhere now. Finally, we'll need an asteroids class. Again, nothing too complicated here. We've got the constructor, we've got an update and a draw function. We have a physics object that describes the physics. We've got the path buffer that says which one we're drawing. We've got the size. We need the size because when we destroy the thing, we need to create two smaller ones from it. So we need to know where we're going next. So path in our physics, our path and our size. We can also define those paths in the initial speed of static constants. It's just convenient. So we have four types of asteroids, and we have an initial speed. Now, let's look at the draw function. First of all, let's just put those constants in. Now, as you can see, our path vertices are simply directed paths. So looking at this top one here, we start at the origin, then we move up, minus 2, 4, and from there we move to minus 2, from there to 2. This forms 
a loop. The asteroids are closed paths. And then we have four path buffers that describe those, and there's our initial speed. So our update function, simply update the physics. Now for our draw, here we actually start using the library in a little bit of anger. So what we first, the first thing we're going to do is create a path factory. And then we're going to create a series of vertices. So our first vertex is the position of the asteroid plus the first vertex. We're going to move there. And then for each of our vertices, from the next one to the final one, we're just going to add, that, add to that vertex and draw a line to it. So again, we're just following a line around a closed loop and drawing it. Then we put that path into the display surface and we draw it using gray. Okay. So let's wire that in to the game. So, our game now, as part of its update function, has some private functions where we're going to update the asteroids, we're going to draw the asteroids, also have added a generate level function, because obviously when you start the game, first thing you want to do, slap everything on the screen and say, right, we have a level here, we have a number of asteroids, we've got a ship, we've got all, all these things. And finally, I have this vector of asteroids here. I'm trying to minimize allocation, and this will be, um, this will be sized at the start, as we shall see. So here's our generate level function. Now, for simplicity, I just made the uh, asteroid paths visible, and we're just going to emplace one asteroid at the back of our vector. Um, so th there's our initial position. And there's our speed and our orientation. Now, I'm a mathematician. Zero degrees is what it looks like on a protractor. So that's pointing out to the right. I'm not an engineer, so zero degrees will be pointing up. As you increase theta, you go anti-clockwise. Engineers increase theta clockwise. All of this is because we invented the clock in the northern hemisphere, not in the southern hemisphere. If we'd invented the clock in the southern hemisphere, our clocks would go anti-clockwise. The amount of trouble this causes is really quite profound. Um, update the asteroids. We simply iterate through the, all, the, all the asteroids. To draw the asteroids, again, we simply iterate through the asteroids and draw the asteroids. So in the constructor, we're going to call generate level. And in our update function, <coughs> we're going to call our update of our asteroids and we're going to draw our asteroids. Let's see if that builds and runs. I really hope so. Will I be doing the happy dance? I don't dance. <laughs> I may if this works, though. Look at it go. There we are. <laughs> right. It's gone. That's wrong. That's not supposed to happen. Now, in the game of asteroids, they come back. They wrap around, don't they? So we're going to have to do some constraining. Um, we're going to constrain the position to lie within the realm of the model, which is between 00, zero and 640, 480. There we are, constrained position. What's that? Um, yeah, I'm not saying this is perfect, not by any stretch of the imagination, and I am absolutely, I am absolutely open to any criticism. I honestly am. It might be hard to make that change here right now during no, this code. I, don't, don't change it, but I, I'm so used to coding with my previous code that I just immediately see 
this this is under last I have to say last night was a little frantic and it's in those it's in those places where the code smells emerge as you will no doubt <laughs> uh, see um, I am not scared of criticism though and I really do welcome um, input in that regard so this is quite a simple function obviously um, particularly there what I want to show off if you recall pauses are vector 2d from the um, from, from, from the yep good excellent uh, <laughs> so we have two particular functions here one is the excessive function and then we have the modifying function which uh, is an overload of the accessor it's non-const obviously so in our update function we'll call this position constraint function there we are Clamp. We have clamp now, don't we? This is Visual Studio 2015. We might not have clamp on this. <laughs> this is very tense over here. <laughs> <Ooh>. Yay! <laughs> right. <laughs> Man alive. Oh, yes. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. Uh, there is no time in update. You're getting ahead of us here. <laughs> You're getting ahead of us here. We'll, we will return to that. There is no time in the update function. I'm assuming um, a constant update, which is a false assumption, as we shall see shortly. Um, there was one other problem. Um, if you remember, in generate level, 321.40. Now, I'm a mathematician. I might have mentioned this. My origin is at the bottom left-hand corner of the screen. Uh, and that 140 was actually from the top of the screen. So what we have, we have a world where the origin is in the bottom left-hand corner, but we have a screen where the origin is in the top left-hand corner of the screen. So that means we have to manipulate everything between world space and screen space. This is pretty trivial in 2D. Uh, but again, the source of some problems in other arenas. So let's have a quick function to manage that. We'll call it screen space, but we'll return the modified vector. Or simply a magic 480, yes, <laughs> yes. I really have. I, when I, my first iteration of this had no constants. It was perfect. And then things started going wrong. I thought, oh, oh, hang on. No, I need this. And then the constants appeared because they're quick and easy. This is how the bad code starts. I'm fully aware of this. Um, yeah, I'm not proud, especially, but I'm sure this works. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's apply this, shall we? Well, obviously what I'll do tonight is I'll go back and I'll find all my constants. I'll lift them out into my special you know, screen class and then I'll, 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 I'll run backwards. Um, I went to bed at 12.30 this morning, just say. No, no it doesn't, but I'm sure that time will come. <laughs> right, so in our draw function in Asteroid, CPP, where we have move to V and line to V, we now have move to screen space V and line to screen space V. So that's our transformation. Okay. Let's see if that works. And also, your really Chanto asteroid fans will realize that the asteroid was upside down. <laughs> Come on. Yes. And that probably looked a little more familiar if you're someone like me who plays asteroids on main or something like that. Right. Marvellous. Right. What do we need now? Ship. Yes, a ship. Great. Thank you. Are you reading my notes? <laughs> <laughs> Let's have a ship, shall we? Now, a ship is a bit different from the asteroid because the physics uh, require control. So the asteroids move at constant velocity about the screen. So their physics are quite simple. So what we're going to do 
which creates a we're going to extend the physics class. Well, we're not going to extend the physics class. We're going to create a new physics class. I'm going to call it controllable physics. Now, we have acceleration and orientation here because we've got thrust. We can move the ship around the screen. Um, and here we have our update function. And here's our thrust function and our spin function. So acceleration will take the uh, uh, orientation that we, uh, the, the, the orientation of the ship and the thrust is what's passed in. See, no magic number there. <laughs> and for spin, we have, uh, we amend our orientation by spin. And then we have our accessor functions as expected. <coughs> We'll also need a new update function to take account of acceleration. So this will be an overload. Which we can implement just as we implemented the last one. So there we add velocity to acceleration. And then we call the update function where we update the position by the velocity. And then we constrain the position. And here's our controllable physics update function. It will become clear why we're zeroing the acceleration. Right, so all we've really done with controllable physics is we've taken the existing physics model, we've added spin and thrust, and that's given us acceleration. So now let's add the actual ship class. So we're into a new source file. Again, nothing particularly unusual here. We're taking a controllable physics object instead. We've got an update and a draw. Controllable physics lives there. All right, this is a little longer. <coughs> So here's our ship shape. It's quite short. It's only six vertices. Our update function simply updates the physics. And our draw function looks very, very, very similar indeed to the asteroid function. In fact, I imagine I could abstract that. But there we are, path factory. And then we move to the position, add the vertex, move to screen space. And iterate through, adding the vertex, and using a line, drawing a path, adding the path, and then drawing the stroke. Finally, let's wire it into the game. So the game requires our ship class. ship instant and then initialize and constructor there we, are. there we are so it takes controllable physics which is built in the set built as a physics object with a position and a velocity so we start at the center of the screen yes magic numbers <laughs> Even harder than before. yep <laughs> I'm glad you're hard on everyone. I really am. People need to be hard at code review. <laughs> they really do. And then we have our update function. We've got one of these and one of these. Right. Can you tell I'm tense? <laughs> Yes, there we are. There's our ship. Right, isn't that exciting? How do I shoot the asteroid? Well, this brings us to input. Unfortunately, 
input hasn't been covered by the HMI group yet. There is a proposal in flight, um, P0249 by Brett Sells, um, but um, for the sake of this presentation, I decided to make a Windows call. Yes, well may you sharply draw your breath. Um, Input.h, here we are. But this is quite simple. Here we are, it. Asteroids namespace. We get our key states, and then we test whether the keys were pressed. Now, the implementation Right, it's quite a lot of code, but actually it's pretty similar. So here is where we keep our keys. Q, W, U, I, and O. None of you, none of you are W, A, S, D here. Oh, no, no. <laughs> we're rotating a ship. We're moving it about. We're firing. Sorry? I'm not const. Good. Yeah, I'll do that. <laughs> Good. I'm delighted. Um, right, anti-clockwise key, press clockwise key. Right, so this tells you where everything is pressed. But you'll notice we also have a fire down and a hyperspace down key. Now, the difference is that these three keys, they act whilst the key is pressed. And whilst the button is pressed, you rotate anti-clockwise or clockwise or thrust. Fire, you don't want that to happen. You want fire to work like that. And particularly hyperspace, you want to press hyperspace and not have the thing moving around the screen. So we have something called a bounce check. So this is a venerable piece of code. So it'll check if the key's pressed, and if it's not down, it'll set down to true, and then it'll return true. Otherwise, it'll migrate the state of the key to the, to the down flag and return false. So it'll only return true if the key has transitioned since the last check from up to down. So I'll get key states. This is the Windows call. <coughs> then anti-clockwise, clockwise, thrust. And with fire in hyperspace, we return the bounce check using these two. OK. Also, we're going to need to keep score. So let's take a look at text support. So there's an object called font resource imported from there. Let's have a function called score. Ooh, fine. Don't want those. And we also want the font resource itself and the score. This is getting a little untidy. Just one moment whilst I set my tabs, whilst I tabulate my code so I can read it properly. There we are. So we've got our font resource, we've got our score. So initializing the font resource. score. So it's initializing the score to zero, but the font resource, we have a font resource factory, which I've made from Korea new. So now let's draw our score. Which gives me a sharp chart to show you how to actually put text on the screen. So from our font resource, we have a function called make glyph run. So I'm taking the score, turning it into a string, and then giving it a position, 50-50. Yep, another magic number. And then we render the glyph run. Yeah. 
Yes, yes, I could. Um, let's see how that works. There we are. So that's at 50 50, but you can see that zero is not really. I think the origin is at the bottom left hand corner of the, of, of the glyph, of the glyph run. So it starts at, it's the 50 50 is the bottom left hand corner of the zero. Now, um, we want to move the ship around, but this, uh, we have to rotate, which introduces some interesting problems because um, if we go back to the ship source file, um, we're actually drawing, effectively, we're drawing this each time, uh, which is not rotated. There are so two things we can do. We can either, well, we need to rotate the path buffer according to the orientation. So let's create a rotate function. This can go in maths. So we're rotating a point by an angle around another point. Sounds like matrix multiplication to me. So it's our first actual implementation in maths. So there we have it. Now the way that you rotate something, you'll take the point where it is, you'll move the system to the origin, then you'll rotate it around the origin, and then move the system back again. So we have our translation, and then I've cached sine and cos theta. So our vector 2D, translation of x times cosine theta, minus translation y times sine theta. And the y component is translation x times sine theta plus translation y times cosine theta. And then we return it back from where it came from. Um, it, obviously, this is mat matrix multiplication. Um, the there is no matrix multiplication support. There's no support for multiplying vectors and matrices in the header yet. I imagine that would be a good addition. So this means we need to put a path buffer into the ship class so that we know which direction it's facing. So I'm just going to replace the constructor. add a path buffer. So let's just restore that constructor. Let's put it up here. So the path, the first version of the path, is the uh, prototype of the ship shape. Now we want to check our input. Some more cons here. So our spin left and spin right, that's how much one spin changes by. Got to go somewhere. Um, I imagine I could create a single class of constants somewhere else. Maybe I'll do that. Yep. Uh, Ship.cpp. What did I say? Right. So the update function now we only want one update. Right. So if anti-clockwise is running, then we spin left. If clockwise is pressed, then we spin right. And then we update our physics. <coughs> now, it's to transform takes the original ship shape there we are. iterates through all of those writes the output to our path 
try to take away yourself from that spiritual reason. Or it's just you can begin with anger and turn it into faith. Yep. Yeah, I'll buy that. I'm delighted you're here. I really am. <laughs> <laughs> it shows the difference. One of the things about Coke Review is... Yeah, you, you, you announce it as modern <coughs> No, it's not. It's not. The modern part is the stuff. Is the stuff from SG13. Okay. I'm, I, as I'm highlighting, the, as I said, a lot of this was done last night in the uh, uh, in, in, in the run through sleep. I'm, thank you. <laughs> and so we rotate everything. Uh, we, we, we rotate at each point about the orient um, about the orientation of the object. Right. Where are we? Right, in the draw function. We want to be drawing our path now, not ship shape. Actually, those two values are the same. No, please. Yeah, no, no, I, I was wondering with the one, but Mm -hmm. Ah, I've forgotten something. Let's just check this works. Right, if I press the keys, nothing happens because we're not actually collecting the key state yet. In game CPP, <coughs> we'll get our input. And we'll do that first of all, top of the update function. Yes. Mm -hmm. Round she goes. Well, that's the next thing, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> right. Actually, adding thrust is pretty easy. Um, so let's create a thrust force in the ship. It's a magic number, in case you haven't already guessed. <laughs> <laughs> Repeating numbers time and again, absolutely, yes. <coughs> so it's that simple. If the thrust button is, is pressed, then we apply thrust to the physics with the thrust force. Let's look at that. Whoa, Whoa Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Right, that's <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, what we now need to do <laughs> Yes. Well, just as we need to constrain the position, so we also need to constrain the velocity. So same again. Physics H. Constrain velocity. Ooh. Go away. Uh, let's create ourselves a maximum speed. So, we're taking, we're, to establish what our speed is, we look at the R value of the polar coordinate of the velocity vector. 
if it's greater than the maximum ship speed, we recreate it by taking the maximum ship speed and the theta value of the current velocity. We turn that back. What do people do during builds? What are your favorite activities? Making tea? Going to bed? Sword fights. <laughs> right. Whoop. Oh, this is a bit snappy. I think probably need to tweak the trust the thrust force. Which is in ship. Let's try that. All right. Oh, that's better. Oh, the inertia is quite. Mm, yeah, look at that. Right. What's missing? Fire. Fire. Right. Yes. Well, that'll come next. Right. Now. Things get a little complicated here, because when we fire, what we're actually doing is creating a new object, the missile. Um, so I'm going to delegate that creation to the game object. Um, so we simply check for fire in the ship update, and we return a flag, and we return the position and the direction, uh, the originating, originating position of the missile. Yes, hello. Which one? There are so many. So? If you have a combination of three values, make it extract memory. Okay. The thing I've seen in code was a couple of boom, boom, boom. And, and it's telling you the time. All right. Not really. You say nothing. All right. Well, for the time being, <laughs> we could work through this and fix all the code as we go. But uh, I'm looking forward to seeing the recording of this and seeing if your voice. It's my head all the way through. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure nobody in this room would be so crass as to suggest that they'd write this code perfectly first time. <laughs> all right. Mm, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, so I'm returning the fire and the position and the orientation. <coughs> so let's make ourselves a missile class. Again, okay, we have an update function and a draw function. We also have a destroy function for when it actually hits something or for when it expires. And we have an active function. Now, the reason it needs to expire is you don't want to fire a missile and just have it go on forever. That's poor gameplay. You need to be able to aim it and for it to just fizzle out so you've got to take, take another go at aiming. So we have an age that tells us whether or not something's active. Right, we are running out of time. I think we're not going to make collision detection. So in our anonymous namespace, missile travel distance per tick and a maximum missile age. All right. A lot of codes that you've probably seen before, which we're going to put into ship at the bottom. All right. So our missile constructor takes a position and the velocity um, with a speed and a distance uh, and our activity. Now, uh, either we create it inactive or active. We create it at its maximum age or as a newborn. So in our update function, if we're active, which here, 
that age less than our maximum missile age. We return true. Otherwise, we update the physics, age a little bit, and return our activity. M age is maximum missile age. That's how we destroy. And our draw. Now, back to the new library. Um, the missile is just a tiny little line segment. So all we, all we do is we move to the screen space and then we line to the previous position, which we get by subtracting the velocity. <coughs> um, we preserve our line width, because somebody else might want the line width to be a different value. And then we path and stroke the path factory of the missile, and then we restore the line width. This is obviously bookkeeping. It's not very popular. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, really, a ah, little bit of a bugbear here. Wiring these into the game is a bit annoying for me personally. What we want to do is keep, at most, four missiles alive. When one dies, it becomes a position available for a new one. Um, so this would be a good use for a ring. Now, I've put forward a ring buffer class to the committee. <laughs> And it's still there. It's been never. Sorry? I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear you. Boost does indeed have one. Um, I wanted to stay within the STD namespace for this, otherwise, I would indeed use the, use the boost one. Um, so, um, until then, I'm going to do it the old fashioned way. Not very modern at all. So, we have number, how many missiles are active? Which slot into the array we're going to use next? Well, we've got a vector of missiles. That was silly of me. Well. Now, I'm just going to tidy things up a little bit here. So now, I'm going to just turn all of our update and draw activities into separate functions. First one. Yeah. Could place the update function. We get our key states, update our asteroids and our ship and our missiles, paint black. Draw asteroid ship and missiles, and then draw the score. So here are our update functions. So updating the ship, we get our. This is ugly as hell. You're quite right. Tuples there. What was I thinking? Because it all makes so much sense at ten in the evening. <laughs> yep. Yes, yes it is. I think I might have made myself a hostage to fortune by <laughs> applying very modern C++ to the title. Um, so, if our first one, our flag, um, is true, and if we don't have four missiles in action, we'll launch a missile. We'll put that in our next missile. We'll do an assign because we have a vector of these existing missiles. Mark it as true for new active. Yeah, absolutely. Yep, I agree. It's very modern C++. It's barely 12 hours old. It's, yes, it is extremely modern. That, thank you, thank you, yes. <laughs> and then we wrap our index round. Increase our missile count. Uh, and then we draw our ship and draw our asteroids. This might seem possibly verbose. 
just migrating draw sh ship draw DS into a separate function, but you know, there we are. And then to draw our missiles, iterate through, draw everything. Let's have a look at that. This is true. Yeah, no collision detection yet. None at all, so I can do, oh, can I even hit it? Yes, I can hit it. Something you could never do in the arcade. Right, um, it's 12.20, time is running short. The next part is collision detection, it takes a while. I will go up to the conservatory after this talk, during lunch, and if you want to see it, I'll implement it before your very eyes. I'd appreciate much more, <laughs> much more critique. No, I love it. I'm totally serious here. I value code review very highly. I value critique very highly. So, you know, I'm, thank you for your contributions. Um, let's go back to my slides. I should take a sip of water because I have the most spectacular dry mouth you can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> that is the hardest presentation of my entire life. <laughs> All right, first thing I have to say, obviously, it's not quite as fast as direct acts. Um, implementation detail, maybe. Um, we optimize our games by writing, by writing shaders for the GPU, um, which is not the purpose of this 2D, 2D API. Um, that would be a different proposal altogether. Um, oh, I lost my mouse. Stateful. As we saw, we're having to push and pop the line width to see what's going on. That's just a pain. That's, that's a bookkeeping nightmare, something that we can work on. But it, it also militates against multi-threaded operation. If you've got state being changed hither and yon, it makes the idea of having different threads right in different parts of the screen <coughs> tricky. I have some questions uh, back. And I, the problem with Cairo is two days. Mm. And you see you always have these very often have these stateful Yes. It's, it's something to work on, certainly. Um, no standard input. I had to use the Windows calls to get the keyboard input. Um, no sound yet, either. So when the dust settles on this, I wouldn't mind trying to get some sound in there. I would hope it might be a little bit easier than 2D graphics. Time will tell. No, and we wouldn't have been able to hear it, no. This is, this is true. Um, but bigger pictures, but, three exclamation marks. Um, this is how I learned to program. Um, back in 1980, um, I was put in front of a computer which was stuck onto a television and I could draw stuff. And that was amazing. And that's not something you can do out of the box with C++. There's no drawing. What you've got is, is text output. And quite frankly, I, I wouldn't have cared at all if I'd been put in front of a screen and shown how to draw letters one line at a time at the bottom, it wouldn't, I would not have found that as compelling or as interesting. You know, I played games, I was a kid, I played games in arcades. If anybody was here three years ago and went to my lightning talk on games, it was, you'd, you'd, have, you'd have learned about my horrific addiction to video games and to arcades. Um, it was the way that I learned to program. And I think kids today will find it much easier learning programming in C++. Because I think kids can learn C++, my son learned C++. I think kids can learn C++, um, but with graphics to write to, it'll be any... It was easy. It's just not easy now. Um, so yeah, better than stood out. <laughs> but not just games. You know, there's, there's, once you've got graphics available as standards, you've got code you can put anywhere. To, to, there's all sorts of things you can do, you know, you can do with decent graphics. I'm not going to suggest that 
you know, great, let's have a fully featured Windows windowing system. It could happen, but yeah. Um, it's part of the HMI, um, you know, goals. It's going to be, it's, it's part of input, so yeah, that should happen. Um, so yeah, teaching opportunities. Kids love drawing stuff. This will make it easier to teach, 